and welcome back to our weekly Bible study. It's all you faithful people online and tuning in through our podcast. This week, we uh, finally get into the scripture that we will be covering this year. And what a doozy. We had eight chapters that we covered this week. Up on the screen, you will see that uh, Elijah's mini study starts in two weeks. Please pray and ask a friend or family member to come out to uh, one of our satellite groups or send them the podcast or video to do the study with you. They don't need to sign up and they will be provided study material. Before moving into our study, I wanted to thank all the listeners who have subscribed to the channel, give a thumbs up and make comments. All this digital activity causes the YouTube algorithm to send out this uh, Christian content to others that it thinks might be interested in hearing the study. So thank you. Now let's uh, bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your matchless sovereignty, not only in our lives, but throughout history. We thank you that your word is a lamp for our feet, a light to our paths, soften our hearts and open our ears to hear your truth. In Christ's powerful name, amen. In our lesson today, one of the uh, kings we will study about seeks advice from two different groups, one being the group of elders and the other a group of friends. So we find a little bit of a generational tension in our scripture this week. So I thought it might be fun to just put up on the screen the top 10 leader traits as published by kind of an older guy's magazine like Forbes compared to the top 10 list for millennial leaders as listed in the Entrepreneur Magazine. Let me just quickly uh, read through these, starting with Forbes. Number one, have faith in their beliefs. Make the hard choice, earn respect, know the team, know people are the key to success, clear vision, push people to their best, serve a greater cause, help the team, and do not lead by force. So that is the 10 leadership qualities from an older perspective. Now, from a younger perspective, there's some overlap, but you can see how they compare. Number one, tech savvy. So if you're going to be a good millennial leader, you must be tech savvy. Moving on. Number two, seek success, innovative, nimble, seek inspiration, mission driven, challenge the hierarchy, collaboration, transparency, and which is the number 10, which is the all time favorite, have fun. I don't want to pick apart these two lists, but I find it funny comparing number seven from Forbes, push people to their best, compared to number seven uh, from the other list, challenge the hierarchy. In our study this week, the main characters are three kings and four prophets. And from these men, I think we might be able to learn a few tips about leadership, but more importantly, Christian leadership which there is no escaping Christian leadership. If you read Titus 2, all of us in some capacity need to be involved in Christian leadership or mentoring. So as we start our study, let's see what we can learn from these positive or negative role models. The following are the four division for today's study. Division one, 1 King chapter 11, Solomon's apostasy. Our second division is 1 Kings chapter 12, 2 Chronicles chapter 10 through chapter 11, verse 4, Israel's division. And our third division is 1 Kings chapter 13 through chapter 14, verse 20, Jeroboam's corruption. And our fourth division is 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 21 through 31, um, and 2 Chronicles uh, verses 5 through chapter 12, 16, Rehoboam's foolishness. Division one. Now that we have our roadmap and are ready to start to study Solomon's apostasy, please open your Bibles to 1 Kings 11. Now, chapter 11 reveals Solomon's descent into idolatry. Before we examine the fall of Solomon, let's take a quick minute and review his noteworthy accomplishments. The slide on the screen lists Solomon's more notable accomplishments. Obviously, he had many more. Solomon oversaw the construction of the temple, expanded the territory of Israel, and constructed additional fortified cities. 
He instituted Israel's first navy. He made silver and gold and cedar wood common in Jerusalem. He spoke 3,000 parables and 1,005 songs, was the wisest and wealthiest king. He had no equal. And I think we tend to forget this one, but God appeared to him twice. And I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have matured as Christians by reading the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. No doubt God blessed and used Solomon in powerful ways. This next slide on the screen shows the do's and don'ts for Hebrew kings. In Deuteronomy 17, Moses clarified what the do's and don'ts were for the future king, Israel kings. Solomon wasn't supposed to acquire a large number of horses, but he did. Solomon wasn't to have many wives, but he did, which is really an understatement. Solomon wasn't to amass too much wealth, but he did, record-breaking amounts. Solomon didn't fully follow God's law. When you think about it, he didn't adhere to the first commandment of the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments. And a king was not to think of himself better than the citizens. However, as an example, it took seven years to build the temple, but it took 13 years to build Solomon's palace. This might be a hint of his lack of humility. As God pointed out in Deuteronomy, Solomon's many foreign wives led Solomon down a dark path of idolatry and turned his heart away from God. Up on the screen are the three main little G gods that Solomon worshipped. Now, Solomon wasn't just bowing down to these idols, but often pagan, pagan temple worship involved perverse sexual practices and sacrifices. There's a lot we can say about these pagan deities, but Ashtoreth was the goddess of the Sidonians, where she was the goddess of sex and fertility. Molech was the pagan god of the Ammonites. He was worshipped through human sacrifice, mostly children. Chemosh was the Moabite pagan god who promoted cruelty and immorality. I'm sure many of you caught this, but in verse 2, Solomon justified his sin by using the excuse of love, which in our culture today, as Christians, we're asked to compromise with sin or look past sin because how can love be wrong? which we need to remember. Love, divorced from biblical truth, is not love. Because of Solomon's disobedience and idolatry in verse 9, God becomes angry with Solomon. So the Lord tells Solomon that he is going to tear the kingdom away and give it to his subordinates. But it won't happen in your lifetime, but your descendants will be left with one tribe. You would think this visit from God would have um, led Solomon to repentance, but it doesn't. As a result of Solomon's poor choices, God took away his peace, and God raised up two external enemies and one internal enemy. Which, let this be a lesson to us. Um, let this be a lesson to us. God will raise up evil men to discipline his servants. God is sovereign. He will use who he chooses to accomplish his will and his plan for mankind. Now, in verses 14 through 22, God raised up Hadad, the Edomite. This slide on, on the screen shows the location of Edom as it relates to Judah. It was just south of Judah and south of the Dead Sea. Hadad was a powerful enemy because he was married to Pharaoh's sister. So he had financial backing and military help from Egypt. The next external enemy is reason from Zoba. Up on the screen is a map showing the country of Aram circled in green and Damascus marked with a red arrow. Reason uh, gathered a band of rebels together and dwelt in the country of Aram and lived near the city of Damascus. He and his gang would raid the northern parts of Israel. So Solomon had two bookends of external threats that he had to deal with. One in the south, and one in the north. Um, I'm sure many of you have noticed this, but God has a sense of humor. For the third enemy, God had Solomon promote his internal enemy, Jeroboam, Jeroboam up through the ranks. Solomon put Jeroboam on the fast track to leadership. 
which is a lesson to us when it comes to God's discipline. He can discipline us from someone who is seemingly in our inner circle. In verses 29 through 39, Jeroboam is met when he was leaving Jerusalem by a prophet named Ahijah. Ahijah revealed God's prophecy that God had earlier told Solomon. Ahijah took his cloak and tore it into 12 pieces, which represented the tribes of Israel. Essentially, 10 tribes would go to Jeroboam and two tribes would remain under the control of Judah. After that, Solomon must have gotten word that Jeroboam was the man that was the focus of Ahijah's prophecy. So Solomon sought to kill Jeroboam. And like Hadad the Edomite, the Egyptians provided cover for Jeroboam. Sin will take you down a path you don't want to go. It will make you do what you never thought you would do. Before Cain killed his brother Abel, God warned Cain that sin was crouching at his door and it wanted to rule over him. In Genesis 4, it's best to heed God's warnings and stay away from sin to avoid divine discipline and self-induced tragedy. Which brings us to our first principle, which is God's mercy comes in warnings. God's mercy comes in warnings. If you think you're going to, to uh, be a leader, you need to follow the, inst the instructions. Solomon didn't follow God's instructions in Deuteronomy 17, as we discussed earlier. As Christian leaders, our instructions come from God's word. Solomon's problem was he left his first love and fell in love with the world. So if you want to be an effective Christian leader, heed the warning in 1 John 2.15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. So let me ask you, when has God called you away from empty pursuits? When has God called you away from empty pursuits? Now, as we get started in our second division, turn to, turn to chapter 12 in 1 Kings, put a bookmark in 2 Chronicles 10 as we review the splitting of Israel. Back in chapter 11, Solomon died, and now his son, Rehoboam, is ready to be coronated as king over Israel. Now, I'm not sure if Solomon shared with his son God's word about tearing the kingdom away, because it doesn't seem to be on Rehoboam's radar. If you turn your attention to the map on the screen, you will see Rehoboam decides to be coronated king at Shechem which is about 35 miles into the northern tribal lands. This discussion, or this decision by Rehoboam, has puzzled Bible scholars. But Shechem has a lot of Bible history dating all the way back to Abraham. Now, in verses 2 through 4, Jeroboam has heard the news about the death of Solomon. So he travels back from Egypt and confronts Rehoboam with an idea to reduce the oppressive royal tax burden. Now, this proposal from Jeroboam seems to have caught Rehoboam off guard because in verse 5, Rehoboam asked them to leave and come back in three days. While Jeroboam and company are away, Rehoboam seeks the advice from elders and his leaders that he had grown up with, essentially his friends. The elders remained, reminded Rehoboam that he is a servant of the people, and if he serves them with a favorable answer, the northern tribes will serve the kingdom. Unfortunately, this advice doesn't sound good to Rehoboam, and so he seeks the ad advice from younger advisors. Now, Rehoboam takes the prize for his inability to discern good advice from really bad advice. So what was this advice? Let me read, starting in verse 10. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will, I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Talk about how to make friends and influence people. That speech writer should have been stoned for such an arrogant speech. Well, as you guys know, this didn't go over well. Jeroboam and company rejected Rehoboam as king and the nation split. But honestly, Rehoboam was fighting an uphill battle because Ahijah's prophecy was in the works, and God is faithful to keep all of his promises. So the nation split in two, according to God's word, 
which we are reminded of this fact in verse 15. Now, Rehoboam, not having a good grasp of the severity of the situation, since his forced labor foreman, um, Haduaram, out to the angry mob. Can you picture the angry mob as they are confronted with a government official backing the plan of higher taxes and the scourging with scorpions? Poor Haduaram didn't have a chance. He was stoned to death, and Rehoboam barely escapes in his chariot. As Rehoboam arrives in Jerusalem, he has one thing on his mind, revenge. In verses 21, he gathers 180,000 young men, which is a huge army, even for today's standards. Rehoboam is about to amp up this conflict into a full-scale civil war. Now, our attribute focus this week is God's sovereignty. God oversees human history, and his plans will not be stopped. So God sends Shemaiah, the prophet, to Rehoboam and his army to tell them to stand down, go home. The division of Israel was God's doing. Surprisingly, Rehoboam humbled himself before God's word and sent the troops home. How sad, the legacy of Solomon's sin ripped the nation apart, and his son had to deal with the consequences of his father. Which brings us to our second principle, which is, Man chooses to sin, God chooses the consequences. How tragic. The climax and decline of the nation of Israel happened in one generation. They went from the temple constructed to a nation divided. Sin is, a, is painful to us and to those around us, and it destroys our communities. I would like to think if Solomon understood the full destruction that his sins would cause he would have turned away from them early on. Now, <clears throat> from our previous study several years ago, we read that David sinned. And when he sinned, he went big. But the difference between David's sin and Solomon's sin, Solomon turned sin into a habit, which he justified because he was in love and he didn't seem repentant about his sin. So if you're going to be an effective Christian leader, you can't be entangled in unrepentant sin. Make it a habit to self-examine and repent from your sin before sin causes division in your life. How have you experienced God's faithfulness amid a broken relationship? Let me ask again. How have you experienced God's forgiveness amid a broken relationship? As we start in division three, Jeroboam's corruption, we will still be in 1 Kings chapter 12, starting in verse 25. After the revolt, Jeroboam initially started to fortify Shechem because it was in his tribal territory of Ephraim. And it's where he initially set up his headquarters. But in verses 26 to 27, we we're quickly told that Jeroboam started to suffer from insecurities as it related to the people leaving his kingdom and going to Judah. He became so fearful about the lure of temple worship and the thought of losing his kingdom and his life that he did the unthinkable. On the screen is a slide listing Jeroboam's corrupting sins. So let's quickly go through them. One, instituted golden calf worship. Two, set up two places of worship in Bethel and Dan, built shrines on high places, appointed non Levite priest, and modified the Jewish feast calendar days. Jeroboam was driven by fear and bad advice, according to 20, verse 28. He was not authorized to change God's ordained Levitical priesthood or the messianic messaging behind the Levitical sacrifices and the Jewish feast days. By messing with God's symbolic sacrifices and ordained feast. How were the people going to learn about the coming Messiah, Jesus, through his system of corrupt worship? I suppose he learned about the golden calf worship when he stayed in Egypt, because in verse 28, he sounds a lot like Aaron when he made the golden calf and said, here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. It's not that Jeroboam led Israel into worship of pagan gods, but he corrupted and cheapen the worship of Yahweh. 
Just so we have a feel for where Jeroboam set up worship, refer to the map on the screen to see the location of Bethel and Dan. Bethel is marked by a green circle and Dan is marked with a red circle. Now, chapter 13 might be one of the most mysterious chapters in the Old Testament. I'd like to say it's all explained in the notes, but not fully. Up on the screen is our thumbnail to Dr. Ken's video. He, he put together on the man of God. So if you want to hear more on this topic, especially from a symbolic messaging point of view, go to, you, go to YouTube and type in AZ Men's BSF to get to our channel and look for this thumbnail to watch the video. But let me say a few things about this battle of the prophets and, and the exposing of Jeroboam's sin. The man of God shows up at Bethel when Jeroboam was performing worship. The, the uh, MOG cried out a curse on the altar and proclaimed a future prophecy. <clears throat> the prophecy stated that a son in David's line named Josiah would sacrifice the priest who make offerings at this altar and burn bones on it. And as a sign that it would happen, the MOG said the altar would be split apart and ashes poured out, and it happened. In our study this year, we will see this prophecy fulfilled about 300 years later through Josiah, a Judean reformer king. Now, obviously, Jeroboam is angry and tells the servants to seize the MOG, but when he pointed, God caused Jeroboam's hand to shrivel up. Now, there's more to this story, so please watch the video. But now, I want to take a few minutes and talk about the old prophet who came searching after the MOG. Now, God had given the MOG strict orders to not stay in Israel, but to go, to go back a different route to Judah. And he wasn't allowed to eat or drink while he was in the land of Israel. Now, we don't know why God had those requirements, which often in our own lives, we don't know the why when it comes to God's plans. But regardless, we must remain faithfully obedient. Now, the MOG decided to rest under the oak, an oak tree, which allowed the deceitful old prophet to catch up to him. This is a shocking story. But the MOG, who stood so strong against Jeroboam, allowed himself to be deceived by the old prophet. Why would the old prophet lie? Why did the lion who killed the MOG just stand there by the body of the MOG? Why did the lion not also kill the donkey? And why was God's punishment so severe for the MOG? There's a lot of puzzling questions for this turn of events, but the bottom line is when we've had, when we've had a spiritual victory, we are very susceptible to a spiritual attack. We will see this same principle played out in the prophet Elijah's life. Also, followers of the followers of our Lord, we have crafty enemies who seek to destroy us. We must exercise godly discernment and always be on guard. Remember what Jesus said when he sent out the 70 disciples? Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Through all this, Jeroboam wasn't moved. He didn't repent of his evil ways. Moving on to chapter 14, God tries to get a hold of Jeroboam again through the illness of his son. Jeroboam's son is deathly ill. It must have been bad because Jeroboam remembers the prophet Ahijah who had anointed him king. So he tells his wife to take gifts and disguise herself to go see the old prophet to inquire what will happen to the boy. But this is a great example that you cannot play games with God. He sees through all the pretense and trickery. So let this be a lesson for us. If we have sin, hidden sin in our lives, and we think we have it under control and God doesn't see it, Think again. That's a dangerous game to play with an all-seeing sovereign God. Back to the story. God warns his prophet Ahijah of Jeroboam's wife. And when she shows up, Ahijah pronounces God's judgment and prophecy on the house of Jeroboam, starting in verse 10. Because of this, I'm going to bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off 
from Jeroboam, every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will burn up the house of Jeroboam as one burns dung until it is all gone. Dogs will eat those belonging to Jeroboam who die in the city and the birds will feed on those who die in the country. The Lord has spoken. Now, my heart breaks for Jeroboam's wife. Not only, not only did she have this very difficult message to take back to Jeroboam, but when she steps into the house, her son is going to die. She will not see her son alive again. Now, up on the screen is the walk she had to make from Shiloh to Tirzah. How difficult that walk must have been. God desires us to follow his guidance and warnings, not because he's an oppressive God, but because he is a loving God who knows what is best for his children. He desires us to flee from sin because sin is so destructive and brings so much pain into our lives, which brings us to our third principle, which is God desires faithful obedience from his servants. God desires faithful obedience from his servants. The Bible says we need to walk by faith and not by sight. Jesus says, if you love me, follow my commands. How does disobedience creep into our lives? For Jeroboam, it was fear of losing his kingly role and the fear of death. For the man of God, he allowed himself to be enticed by what appeared to be a godly man. Once again, if you want God to use you in leadership, the only fear we should have is fear of God, and we must develop and cultivate godly discernment. So let me ask you, what makes it challenging to follow God 100% of the time? As we start <clears throat> our last division, Rehoboam's foolishness, I'll be in 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 21 through 31, and 2 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 5 through chapter 12. In 2 Chronicles, the writer describes the good things that occurred in Judah for the first three years after the revolt. Seems like Judah went through a period of reform and rebuilding. The slide on the screen has a list of positive things in Judah. At this time, there was a migration from the north to the south for people who wanted to follow the Lord, which included the Levites who were of the priestly class. These new arrivals helped the nation of Judah. Verse 17 in 2 Chronicles says, they strengthened the kingdom of Judah. For three years, they made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, secure. For they walked for three years in the way of David and Solomon. Which, a truth about godly people, they're like the salt. They act as a preserver to the community they live in. This is an Old Testament account of Jesus's New Testament teaching when he said his followers are the light and salt in the world in Matthew 5. During this time, Rehoboam started to rebuild many of the cities and fortify the cities and stock them with weapons and supplies. Unfortunately, the revival was short-lived according to 1 Kings verse, uh, chapter 14, verses 22 through 24. The slide on the screen highlights Judah's failures. It says, Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord, stirred up the Lord's anger. They built high places to worship pagan gods. They set up uh, sacred stones and Asherah, Asherah poles. They even had male shrine prostitutes. As mentioned earlier, often pagan worshiped, worship centered around perverted sexual acts. And one of those acts was sodomizing young men. Well, when a nation or community falls into extreme pagan worship, it's not long before the Lord responds with divine judgment and discipline. Within two years of Judah doing evil, which Rehoboam's fifth year, which was Rehoboam's fifth year as king, the Lord sends divine discipline in the form of Pharaoh Shishak. On the screen is the map of Shishak's military campaign. According to the red highlighted route, Shishak had military success in both the northern and southern kingdoms. One of the big biblical mysteries is what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. Verse 26 tells us that Shishak and his army carried off the treasures of the temple and the royal palace. 
I wonder if this is if this was Spielberg's source material for the blockbuster movie Raiders of the Lost Ark to show that the Ark was lost in history in Egypt. Now, I'm not saying that Shishak took the Ark of the Covenant, but I was just making that observation. Back to Judah in 2 Chronicles 12, the Lord sent the prophet Shemaiah to Rehoboam and to the other leaders and told them in verse 5, thus says the Lord, you abandoned me, so I have abandoned you to the hand of Shishak. In an amazing turn of events in verse 6, the leaders humbled themselves before the Lord and said, he is righteous. The Lord relented from his full plan of discipline and granted them partial deliverance. It's clear from verse 8 that God wanted the leaders and the people of Judah to learn from this bad experience, that sin destroys and kills, but God's ways are much better. In this lesson, we have talked a lot about sin, and the doctrine of sin is BSF's focus doctrine of this week. So please read your notes about this important doctrine. But let me say a few words. When we believe sin has infected us and the rest of humanity, we run to Jesus for salvation. Only he can restore what sin has destroyed. When we do not believe in the pervasive reality of sin, we cannot explain the brokenness evident in ourselves, humanity, and the world. If we believe people are born basically good, we do not recognize the seriousness of sin or the need for salvation. Which brings us to our last principle, which is God desires his leaders to be dependent upon him. God desires his leaders to be dependent upon him. Rehoboam had an evil heart, but he was at his best when he was silent and relied upon God. He did that when Shemaiah told him to stand down and not go to war. And when war did come through Shishank, he humbled himself and relied on the Lord for deliverance. As Christian leaders, if we want to lead in a way that draws others to God, we must humble ourselves before God, and we must seek God's counsel through prayer and lead through the power of the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you, when have you relied on the inexhaustible resources of God? In summary, we have discussed three kings who have left a lasting legacy. And unfortunately, these men, if they, if they could have a second chance or a mole again, they might, make a different, they might make different choices. But each one of us, regardless if you realize it or not, are leaving a legacy. And as you know, there are no do-overs. So flee from sin and run to the only Savior, Jesus Christ, like the prodigal son did. And in return, the father ran to him and restored him. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you pursue the wayward sinner. Each one of the men we have studied tonight, you pursued to have them turn away from their sin and turn back to you. Thank you for having a plan for the sin problem that plagues mankind. And be with us now as we go to our groups to discuss this lesson. In Christ's name, amen.